those reasons are to reach students whom you might not otherwise reach, like Todd, for example, or like English language learners, for example, who will learn the language of a song far sooner than they will learn language out of your grammar lesson. To reinforce concepts taught in content areas. Um, how many of you remember being taught the song in 1492. Did you ever learn that one with Columbus? Columbus sailed the ocean. Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Okay. Think of another content area that you come back to again and you think of the song before you necessarily think of the concepts. Can you think of one? Well, we did Schoolhouse Rock for many content areas, so I think of those all the time. All the time. Mm -hmm. They come back. I still know all the words. Yep. And what cracks me up is when I see adults and you ask them to do something in alphabetical order, and if they're not used to doing it, they'll go, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, You know, and it's because there's a content connection with the song that they want, right? So we have lots of excuses to be able to use um, music in the classroom to reinforce content areas. And, and my kids still remember how to say all the names of the states in order because they learned a song about that, you know? Um, They've learned songs about continents over the years. Probably I'm trying to think what else they have. And I, I'm too brain dead right now to, to know. But um, lots of reinforcing of concepts through content and through music. And then increasing joyful learning. And I love that phrase, joyful learning. Joyful learning is different than fun to me. Fun is, fun might be connected to learning, it might not. But joyful learning is still learning. It surpasses fun, and yet it's joyful. And so what would you rather do? Have something pushed down your throat or learn it in a joyful way? You know, wouldn't you much rather learn something in a joyful way than have it forced upon you? Um, one of my favorite authors wrote that when she was in college, she hung a sign on her door that says, that which is forced is never truly learned. And that was like a statement to the world that she hated being she was in college because she felt like everything was forced upon her. And music will oftentimes create joy in people. The, the ability to express creates joy, as does art, um, if it's taught right, can create joy in people, as can athletics create joy in people. So what a wonderful thing to be able to add joyful learning to the classroom. In order to Put music into your classroom. It sure helps if you can have some basic awareness of music vocabulary. So pitch, that's the highs and the lows. Okay, melody, that's the whole um, the song line. Um, beat is always steady. <laughs> I just made the remote ring out. So the beat is always steady, and we, when we talk to kids about beat, we often compare it to a heartbeat or the dripping of a faucet. And so beat is always steady, no matter what. Rhythm is much more difficult to put your finger on. But if you'll notice when you talk, there's a rhythm to your words. And especially if you say a poem, there's a rhythm to the poem. And so if you were to say a poem in rhythm, take away the words and clap the poem, that would be the rhythm. Okay, if you clap the poem without the words, that would be the rhythm. So it's that underlying pattern that, that words or music make that is not necessarily steady. Okay, it's, it's an underlying flow of pattern of sound. Uh, tempo is speed, how fast or how slow it goes, and form is how it's laid out. And um, again, in poetry, we'll often have a, 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 a stanza and then a stanza that repeats. Think of Think of a song in church that you sing when there's the verse and then uh, the chorus and the verse and the chorus and the verse and the chorus. And sometimes we'll do that in poetry too. And so uh, form is how that song is laid out. Is it just verse, 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 verse? Or is it verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus? Or is it verse, chorus, something else, verse, chorus? You know? um, and and we'll, we'll talk about form a little bit more as the class goes on throughout the semester. More advanced music vocabulary, which you don't need, but you might hear used, especially
especially if the person in the classroom also has a musical background, you might hear notation, which is how we write the music down, improvisation, which is creating your own music on the spot, um, timbre, which is the quality of the music, whether it's a, a wood sound or a metal sound or a singing sound, ostinato, which is um, kind of a background song going behind the music. And there's a difference between teaching music and integrating music. When you teach music, you're working right off the standards. You've got accountability as a music teacher. If you're a music teacher, you've got accountability. You've got to teach certain standards. As a classroom teacher, you've got to teach reading standards, math standards, social studies, science standards. When you integrate, you should be aware of the music standards, but it's not the same accountability for music standards as if you were a music teacher. Okay? So you need to kind of rest on the accountability. Now, does that mean you can teach music any way you want? No. Okay? Because you still need to be able to honor the truths behind music. So you need to know enough that you're not going to call melody harmony and harmony melody and beat rhythm. Okay? Because you want to teach truth. So when you're teaching music, you're teaching the standards. When you're integrating music, you're still responsible for your content standards, not the music standards. When you're teaching music, you're teaching musical concepts and you're teaching them more in depth because your purpose is to teach the standards. But when you're integrating music, you're going to touch on musical concepts and you're going to do everything you can to honor those concepts by teaching them correctly and truthfully, but you're not going to go into depth just want to make sure you're not teaching anything incorrectly. Um, and, and really that crosses into all, all content anyway. If you're teaching something in science and you integrate a piece from social studies and you tell a lie, then you're not teaching very well, are you? And here's an example of that. A preschool teacher who's been doing way up high in the apple tree, two little apples looked at me and I shook that tree and down they there's another line anyway. I shook that tree and <laughs> mm, they were good. Is the last line okay? And um, see, I have these senior moments at 53 that I'm not liking too much. Um, I shook that tree as hard as I could, and down came the apples. Mm, they were good. I knew it would come back to me. So the teacher's been working on way up high in the apple tree. And they do a, a unit on Hawaii, and she says, oh, good, I can change the words of way up high in the apple tree, and we'll do a song about Hawaii, a finger play about Hawaii. And so, so she goes, way up high in the pineapple tree. Now, what's the problem there? Pineapples grow on the ground. So you have just taught an entire generation of preschoolers incorrectly. You've taught them a lie. <laughs> And that's not a big deal until they're in fourth grade. And on some comprehension test that's really obscure, there's a picture of a pineapple, and the four multiple choice answers are, well, the question is, where would this grow? And the four multiple choice answers are a tree on the ground in the water at the zoo. And you've just screwed up that preschooler who's going to get to that test someday and put in a tree. Okay? So you've got to be careful to teach concepts correctly whenever you're integrating from two different areas. You still have to teach truthfully. Um, 